Good word. Joshua, turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are, we are making our way, having gone through this letter together, this, this statement, perfect gospel, is what our gospel is, to an imperfect church, which is what the church at Corinth was, and that was an understatement to call them that, an imperfect church. But as we pointed out at the beginning of this study, every church is an imperfect church. When I was young, probably still in college, a minister, an older minister was talking to me and he said, he said, son, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it. Because after you join it, it won't be perfect anymore. Imperfect churches. Made up of Christians. Sinners saved by grace, undergoing sanctification on our way to glory, not yet in glory. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 11. This is our third look at this today. If you'll stand with me, having found that in your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, you can see the text on the screen and follow along as I read this. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. What have we just read together, folks? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And how we need this Word today. When Christianity is being sideswiped from all directions, hit head-on, head-on collision by the culture, but sideswiped by its so-called friends. We need clarity on the gospel. And we need to say, ask ourselves the honest questions. Is that my testimony? What Paul is writing here. Is that my testimony? Could that be said of me? I preached a funeral this past week. If the Lord Jesus tarries long enough, somebody will preach your funeral. Somebody will preach my funeral. What will they say? What will they be able to say in the light of how we've lived? Thank you. Please be seated. Well, just as the heart pumps life-giving blood to every part of the body, so the truth, the reality of the resurrection gives life to every other area of gospel truth. It is the pivot point, the resurrection, the, the physical, bodily, time and space resurrection of Jesus Christ on which all of Christianity turns and without which none of the other truths would matter. It is the infallible proof that when Jesus said who He said He was, He spoke truth. It is the infallible proof that when Jesus said He would do what He did, this makes it infallibly true. Without this, it's myth. Without this, it's a, it's a noble story of a noble life. Without this, it's a commendable example. We suggested to you last week, without the resurrection, this story would have faded into anonymity. 
You need to learn to think of the resurrection as the focal point. When we studied the Old Testament passages, particularly when we went through the, through the book of the Bible this past couple of years. We said to you that the character of God, the holiness of God, is the core characteristic of God. And when you think of God's wrath, it's holy wrath. When you think of His love, it's holy love. When you think of His kindness, it's holy. Never compromise. It's always tied to this, this holy character. When you think of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to learn to think of the resurrection as the focal point that grips us and says, you need to listen and pay attention to everything Jesus said as recorded in the Scriptures. That's how important it is. Somebody diminishes it, run, run. He taught them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. We've looked at those passages in the previous two studies of this, verses 1 through 11. Now, I want to remind you of the, of the outline, the five point outline. We're at number three of this today. First of all, there's the testimony of the church. We looked at that already, verses 1 to 2. The testimony of the scriptures. We looked at that last week, looking at different places in the Word of God, verses 3 and 4. Today, the testimony of the eyewitnesses, verses 5 to 7 eyewitnesses. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 7. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Of course, he's going to add himself to that in verse 8. We're going to look at that separately because of the language he uses. Eyewitnesses. The witness to the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming and so compelling. I read one writer who said it would take more, and you put quotes, it would take more, quote, faith to believe he didn't come out of the tomb than it would to believe he did, all right? I think it's in John MacArthur's commentary on this. He said, he quotes two sources, a, a, a lawyer, a Sir Edward Clark, that as a lawyer, I've made prolonged study of the evidences for the events of the first Easter day. For me, the evidence is conclusive and over and over again in the high court. Listen to this. I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. In other words, I have, as an attorney, gotten the verdict I was looking for on less evidence than there is evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Inference follows on evidence, and a truthful witness is always artless in disdain's effect. The gospel evidence for the resurrection is of this class. In other words, it's not, it's, it's not some, uh, some uh, fantastic, beyond-the-pale, elaborative scheme. It's just honest eyewitness. As a lawyer, I accept it unreservedly as the testimony of truthful men to the facts they were able to substantiate. So substantiated, truthful facts. A historian named Thomas Arnold said this, The evidence for our Lord's life and death and resurrection may be and often has been shown to be satisfactory. It's good according to the common rules for distinguishing good evidence from bad. Thousands and ten thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece as carefully as every judge summing up on an important issue. He's going to go ahead and talk about this a little bit. Folks, have you thought about how for 2,000 years skeptics, antagonists have combed over the documentation and not been able to find anything to say, no, no aha moment. In fact, every attempt they've made has simply verified and validated it. I think I've told you about this before. There's a movie, I think it's entitled The Centurion, I believe is the name of it. It was fascinating because it took the perspective around the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus of a Roman centurion who was at the crucifixion and then was charged with the responsibility of finding the body of Jesus after it disappeared. It's, it's, it's historical novel type, but 
But what happens in it is so plausible, so feasible, that it's really a compelling uh, look. And if you haven't watched it, I would, I would commend it to you. So, Jesus appears to Cephas, to Peter. We could spend a lot of time here. You remember when, when he was first encountered after the resurrection, he said, so when go tell the disciples and Peter to meet me. We've looked at this before in different settings in the past. I think it's amazingly merciful that he singles out Peter. I want you to put yourself where Peter was. Peter, Peter was in the courtyard after having boasted and said, look, others may deny you, but I will, I'll die for you. I'll never deny you. And he denies Jesus to this young maid. Jesus had told him, he said, before the rooster crowed, you'll deny me, Peter. Sure enough, after he had denied him those, those times, this rooster crows and he's brokenhearted. Put yourself there. Would you have thought for a moment after that, when Jesus had told you it was going to happen, and you'd said no way, and it did happen, would you have put yourself among the band of faithful disciples? I tell you, no. You would have thought, that I, I, have, I have blown it beyond repair. I have sinned beyond recovery. I have denied even knowing Jesus. I have cursed his name. What a mercy. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Not, not separating Peter from the disciples, but making sure that if the messenger, go tell the disciples, wouldn't, wouldn't have the opportunity to draw the conclusion, well, I'll go tell uh, the ten. I don't think Peter would qualify now. No. Go tell the disciples and be sure you tell Peter. And so Paul, in recounting these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, Mentions Peter first. And he, he appears, this word, this word appear that we need to look at. We talk about these appearances. The word here means to see so as to perceive. You know, James talks about us reading the Word of God the same that a person, a casual person, would look in a mirror where he, where he or she comes to the mirror and walks away and forgets what he's seen. The person was exposed visually to the image in the mirror but did not, did not perceive. Sometimes, uh, you've, if you've ever played the game uh, Evidence, and you, you look at something, you look around and say, okay, now look away and tell me, uh, guys, if you ever play this with your wife, you better play close attention because what you don't want to do is say, okay, what color, what color lipstick do I have on? Um, probably in the red. No, no, you're, you're going to get in trouble that way. Color blouse. Well, I'm in the color spectrum, I know. See, perceive. You, you, you see it. It's, it's, it's similar, but a different word. When, when John says in his prologue, we beheld his glory. We didn't, ga we didn't glance at his glory. We gazed upon it. We studied it. So, so he appeared to these people. And as you put the, the timeline together, you realize that, that uh, Mary Magdalene was there in the garden when Jesus showed up, but she didn't know who he was. Sir, where, you know where they've taken my Lord? And it's not until he calls her name. Look at this passage, John 20, verses 14 to 16. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Why, whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. He said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. She was seeing him, but she had not perceived him. Jesus said to her, Mary, when he called her name, she saw him, she perceived him. He turned to him in Aramaic and said, Rabboni, that is teacher. 
Whenever Jesus appeared to Peter, as, as Paul, it, was, it was after that, that encounter with Mary Magdalene, and it was before the encounter uh, with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Look at this real quickly in Luke 24. We'll just look at verse 15 and 31. Uh, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Of course, you know the narrative there. Uh, why, why are you so downcast? He, they say, are you the only person in the region that doesn't know that the one, the one called Jesus, whom we thought was the Messiah, was crucified today? And then he begins. He says, why are you so dull about this? He begins to teach them, to, to go at the beginning of the Scriptures. I can't imagine, wouldn't you have loved to have been plugged into that sermon? Walking along the road to Emmaus as Jesus exposits the Old Testament and shows how it was about Him, that the Christ must suffer. Verse 31 says, And their eyes were opened, and they recognized Him. And as soon as they did, he vanished from their side. And they talk later and say, didn't our hearts burn while he was teaching us? So it was, before, it was after Mary Magdalene had encountered him in the garden, before these disciples. We don't have the record, is what I'm telling you, of when he appeared to Peter. What we have is Paul's assertion and the support of Scripture. The disciples, it was gathered together on, on the first Sunday evening in John 20, 19 and 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. This is not, this is not the bold crowd that comes bursting out of the upper room on the day of Pentecost. These fellows are hunkered down, wondering, are they going to do to us the same thing they just did to our rabbi? Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They, they recognized him for who he was there. It goes on in Luke 24, 33 and 34, as you develop this, this timeline. They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying... The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. We don't know the conversation that went, took place there. But again, I point out what a mercy that Jesus went out of his way to come to Simon Peter. Say, Peter, it is I. To do some restoring, some healing. Some encouraging. To assure Peter that when, that when the disciples would get the word out that Jesus had summoned the disciples to meet with him at this place or that place, that he was included among their number. I told you about John 20, 19, where he appeared. Look at Luke 24, 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be unto you. So, he appeared to Peter. He appeared to the twelve. They were called the twelve even though there was only eleven of them because Judas had, had departed and had committed suicide by this time. But they were known as the twelve. These were the, this was the group. And one, there would be a substitute that would be assigned to take Judas's place in the book of Acts. But, but the twelve, that was their, that was their description. When I was doing uh, Reformation at First Baptist Church in Clinton, Louisiana, decades ago now, and uh, some of the congregation was not happy that we were saying that you really, adultery should not be considered as normative in the, in the church or the Christian life. Um, so the deacons were, were solidly, I mean, just stood as one man, one voice with me. It was a beautiful thing to see. Uh, and... So they began, to, the people in the church in the town began to speak of Bill and his boys. That was the, that was the designation, Bill and his boys. Um, of course, these were all grown men, most of them older than me. I was a mere lad among them at the time. That's their designation, the 12. And he appears to them. 
And then, though, <laughs> this is the, th the one that blows me. He appears to the 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are alive today, though some have died. This is a compelling argument. More than two decades later, and Paul is writing the letter to the Corinthians. Most of the 500 brothers are still alive. I've, I've thought about this. In that setting, set, within, within days of the crucifixion, there wasn't any more than a 40-day period before Jesus ascended back to heaven. From the time he rises from the grave, And Pentecost, I told you before that in the Jewish festival you had Passover. He was slain on Passover. Pentecost is the word 50. It is, it is the, the culmination of seven sabbatic cycles, seven seven-day cycles, 49 on the 50th day of Pentecost. Within that period of time, at some point, Jesus meets with 500 people. What, what, would, what would occasion 500 people? And where would you do that? How would you do that? There's no way you do it safely. Not with the Romans still looking for the body of Jesus. Not, not with the Romans wanting to, to silence the message. To stomp out any hint of any possibility that he is risen from the grave. Where would that happen? And the only thing I can conclude is word continued to spread. He's, he's alive. Jesus is alive. The, the rabbi is alive. The master has risen. And word began to spread and they, and they gathered for a worship service with Jesus. In other words, they wouldn't have just gathered to gawk. They gathered to worship with Jesus and to worship Jesus. I would imagine he was at one and the same time he was the object of worship. He was the leader in worship. He was the preacher in worship. And I thought about what if Jesus comes again during worship? Now I understand that within the U.S. there are people that are worshiping in four different time zones. And then when you expand it to the whole world there are many different time zones. And I'm not one of these people that thinks, well, that the United States has an inside track on Jesus, that he, he prefers America more. No, I'm not one of those people. Brothers and sisters, he appeared to 500 people at one time. If he chooses to appear the second time in worship, where will he find you and me? There have been some times in my life when I've been disappointed uh, that I, didn't, I wasn't here, I wasn't there, and someone says, man, you should have been there. I, I, this, there's not even a close second. We were worshiping this incredibly amazing, awe-inspiring event took place in Jesus in our midst. This appearing to 500 brethren, most of whom are alive today, to this time, Paul said, 20 years after the fact, both grips me in terms of this, the preponderance of witnesses. At this point, you can't silence the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't track down humanly 
And clearly they had not tracked down humanly because Paul is writing 20 years later saying most of these 500 are alive today. If you want to talk with them, they'll tell you. They met Jesus after he was crucified, after he'd risen from the dead. That grips me. And it also grips me of the value Jesus places on the corporate gathering of his people. And I don't know how it's going to end for you, how it's going to end for me. But I'll tell you what. If the people of God are gathered, I want to be gathered with them. One of the reasons is, I don't want to miss Jesus if he shows up. That would be the ultimate downer. You should have been there. Which you can only answer, you're right. I should have been there. He's 500 witnesses. Then he appears to James. Now, there's James, the son of Zebedee. There's James, the son of Alphaeus. And then there's James, his half-brother. And writers are mixed, but, but many of the conservative writers come down believing this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. If you go back and read the Gospels, you'll remember that that at one point we're told that, that his, his siblings thought he had a demon. That only a demon-possessed person would go around saying, I'm the Son of God. By the way, that's true. Unless it's true that you are the Son of God. As one, I believe it was Josh McDowell said, for someone to claim to be the eternal Son of God, he's either... He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, which would put him in the category of the insane or demon-possessed, or he's the Lord. He actually is the Son of God. And James was one of these skeptics. They went with Mary to fetch Jesus out because they were concerned about, about his circumstances as crowds were gathering and put yourself in Mary's position from it. She pondered a lot of things in her heart, uh, but still you don't ever fall out. And the, and, the, and the siblings were not even there to do any pondering. They simply grow up in a setting where Jesus, the firstborn, is highly favored. Put yourself in the position of the siblings. They're concerned. They're concerned about their mom. Uh, they're concerned about Jesus. What's going to happen if he's shown to be a fraud? The, the, the family would never recover. The family name would never recover from this. So there's this concern. And they go and they tell, tell Jesus, right? And they say, well, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. When you piece it together, they clearly want to take him home, talk him out of this, uh, this, this thing he was doing. Jesus says, who are my mother? And my brother, those who do the will of God, who listen to me, that's my family. So you have this half-brother who was a, who was a skeptic, but he's, he is converted in the aftermath of the resurrection. He appears to James. And James, this half-brother of Jesus, becomes one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem, when you read over into Acts 15, we won't develop that. I just encourage you to go take a look at it. James, the brother of Jesus, is saved. And so he appears. And how, how special that must have been. Again, put yourself in James' spot. You spent a goodly portion of Jesus' ministry trying to get him to stop doing what he was doing. Stop embarrassing himself. Stop embarrassing the family. You live to see him crucified, which is your worst fears. And then he rises and everything changes. And Jesus appears to his half brother. I want you to see in, in, these, in these resurrection appearances. Not only the convincing witness that Jesus is alive, but the tender compassion of Jesus. 
There's none of this. You, you had your chance. Mentality with him. He goes to James. And so I want to ask you today. Think with me a few minutes. Have you seen something about Jesus? Or has he appeared to you? You can be fascinated with the story of Jesus. Particularly if you, if you grew up in a home like I did, where from the earliest days my mother was faithful to tell me the story. My Sunday school teachers, from the earliest memories, would tell me stories about Jesus. In the context of Bible stories. And you can grow up knowing a lot about Jesus and not knowing Jesus. I mean, not knowing Him personally. Not perceiving Him. Peter denied Him. Now, he was with Him every day for the three, three and a half years of His ministry. Peter denied Him. And I'm convinced, considered himself finished. He was a coward in the face of a little peasant girl. And yet, when Jesus appeared to him, post-resurrection, Peter goes from this coward to the man who comes out of the upper room on Pentecost and says, this Jesus whom you crucified with wicked hands God is raised from the dead. A boldness comes. Even the cowards. When you have perceived Jesus. James was a skeptic. It's, it's safe to say the best we can tell from the record. For Jesus' entire earthly ministry, James, his half-brother, was embarrassed of him and embarrassed by him. And yet in the aftermath of the resurrection, James perceives him. And everything changes. Everything changes. He rises up. He's a bold witness. Leads the church in Jerusalem. The burgeoning church formed after Pentecost. Have you savingly perceived the resurrected Jesus Christ? I lived a goodly portion of my life up till age 20. I've memorized talking to Norman the other day, I think, about, about the cutting my teeth growing up. In our vacation Bible schools, they would have these Scripture memory cards. They looked like kind of small report card type thing, a little, little packet, a little sleeve. And in it was these uh, cards, maybe, maybe three by five cards. Scripture verses printed on the front and the back. The first day of vacation Bible school, they'd give us a card. And, and if you memorize the Scriptures, you got a reward or a treat or something. And and I, I blew through the cards, all the cards they had before the week was out. Just because I had a really competitive spirit about me. I didn't want anybody memorizing more scripture than me. That's, that's not, nothing noble about that. That's carnal. But, but uh, what, a, what a legacy. Cut my teeth on. Passages and passages of scripture. 100% attendance pins. I've told you about those. I've, I found some a year or so back. We were cleaning out some of the little jewelry boxes, and there's a couple of 100% attendance Sunday school pins. I was all about reward. I knew a lot about Jesus. I just didn't know Jesus. I didn't have a saving relationship with Jesus. Jesus. Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection had not changed me from the inside out, had not transformed me. 
And that's what I see happening. One of the, one of the side themes of the post-resurrection encounters. And Paul is, this is what Paul's building to, I believe, when he talks about him being seen by Peter. Seen by the twelve. Seen by this, this gathering of over 500. Seen by James. Paul's not only nailing down the historical reality of the resurrection, because he does not tell us every post-resurrection appearance. He's picked them out to make a point. The next thing he's going to tell us, which we'll reserve till next Sunday, Paul says, and then he appeared to me. I want you to think about this question this week. We're going to ask it in a different way next week. But Paul, Paul's story and the language he uses to describe Jesus appearing to him is amazing, shocking, so compelling. Brothers and sisters, The resurrected king is still in the business of resurrecting people from their sin. He died and rose again, according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. Is that for you more than a historical reality? Look, if, it is, if it's at least that, you're set apart from most of the culture which laughs at the possibility of this. Is that for you more than a historical reality? Is it a life-transforming reality that you've never gotten over? And if it, you've really encountered Jesus savingly, you never will get over it. But you're never the same. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankful for the testimony here that Paul is giving us. He's, he's reciting the historical events of the resurrection of Jesus and his appearances in the aftermath of the resurrection. And Lord, it is compelling. If there's anyone here today who is sitting here doubting, saying, oh, I know it says that, but you know, so many people question that. Oh, dear God, have mercy on the doubter. Have mercy on the skeptic. Show them the utter, utter folly of such a position and convince them that this biblical witness is true. And because it is true, that it's critical for us to have a true saving relationship with the crucified and risen Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords. Father, for those here who, who are convinced, may the, may the power of the resurrection, the power of the gospel, Strengthen and confirm and encourage and equip and provoke and convict. And may we live our lives going forth wanting to be in the right place at the right time when this resurrected King returns. Oh God, I don't want someone to have to say to me, you should have been there. You should have been there. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.